Greetings, Stars fans, and welcome to the Two Brothers Mic'd Up show. If you didn't know, we sit down, we'll discuss what just happened in the recent Dallas Stars game, give you our thoughts right here on the internet, here on YouTube. We'll have a game of NHL going on in the background if you want to watch that. But as we start each video, we start off with predictions from the last video, so always stick around to the end whenever we give scores for what we think the game might come to. Quinny liked a score of 4-3 to three for Dallas and a score of 5-1 to one for Tampa if they were going to win. You hit on the Stars prediction. I liked a score of 5-3 to three for the Stars and a score of 6-2 to two for the Lightning if they were going to come on top. It seemed that Whoever was going to score four or five was going to be the ultimate winner of this game. The last game, I believe it was five to three. You know, it just, it just, these two teams, the last uh, couple of games that they played against, uh, the first one to four or five was always the winner. So I think we took that into account with what the score was going to be. But let's start with a little Brendan Morrow talk. Brendan Morrow signs a one-day contract, retires as a Dallas star. Tampa Bay is in town, kind of bookending his career. He starts with Dallas, finishes with Tampa. He spent one season in Tampa. Talk about what Brendan Morrow meant to you for this franchise. I mean, he, he pretty much embraces what old-school hockey used to be. Um, just, like his physicality that he brought is pretty much what defined his role as as the the great stars player that he was. Yeah, uh, Brendan Morrow was really like grit. He was the guy that really did a lot of the. He, Brendan Morrow talked, but he also backed it up a lot. He didn't take anything out on the ice that he knew that he couldn't handle. Brendan Morrow could pretty much handle any situation that was dealt to him. And with him being the captain, it really seemed like it was his era whenever he got handed the the team as the captain. Uh, he was a guy that put his heart on the line. It's he, he was just a guy that was kind of a utility knife. He could be used in any situation. Uh, he fought. He scored. You know, he actually scored a lot of goals for Dallas. Um, seeing him did, cause, uh, seeing him in town, and it kind of seemed like, you know, the way he looked, he looked like he could still probably play. It would have been nice if he, you know, if he could still kind of play, maybe bring him in for at least nine games so he gets like a thousand games. That'd be pretty nice. But in his retirement uh, video, and like I was listening on the radio, you know, he really appreciates the Dallas Stars. This is, I mean, this was his team, and, you know, the fans truly loved him. He, He's one of those players that comes back that, when you ask people and fans like who their favorite players were over the years, Brendan Morrow's name comes up. It's not like uh, Brendan Morrow was a favorite player of mine, just like uh, Jamie Langenburner. I like those kinds of guys that they're not the flashy guys. They go out and they they talk with their hands. They they throw their bodies around. Those are the type of players that I've always liked. You know, you wouldn't think the style that Brendan Morrow, you know, people would like it for a first couple of seasons, but then if, if it ever started to fade, you know, players tend like that tend to not really stick around in the fans' minds. It's usually the flash and the score that come along with the praise, but Brendan Morrow was one of those players that was always liked and will always be welcomed to this organization. Uh... Let's go into the scores of this game. We had Kucherov and Spezza in the first period. We had Steven Stamkos, Jamie Benn, and Steven Stamkos in the in the second period. It was all it was the captain show in the second period. And we have Steven Johns and Jamie Benn in the fourth period. The game kind of starts at a 
medium pace. Like, there wasn't a lot of hustle out there. It did seem like it kind of dragged out, kind of making to where each team was trying to fill each other out. You know, not no one really wanted to take the reins of the momentum, it seemed, from the beginning. You know, it it's games like this that, you know, worry me with the Dallas Stars. Because if they don't come out jumping, it seems like it, they're not hungry enough. How did you interpret, like, the pace of the way the, the game started? I actually thought they, they came out pretty good, contrary to what to what you think. But I think they came out with a lot of hustle. I mean, they were putting shots on. They were, they were playing the body as much as they could. It's just that they're, they're still sticking around with those little minor details in their game that are just making them not have as much momentum moving forward as they should in the first period of this game. The start of the game, it did seem the Stars were scrambling a bit. Yeah. You know, it, it the hunger just wasn't there. They, they, they didn't jump on Tampa the way I thought they might have responded against the L.A. game. Yeah, I, I, I feel the pace was there. I feel the skating and everything was there. But it's like you said, that it didn't feel like the Stars were aggressive enough to, to bring that hunger out. It seemed like they were just trying to get a feel for Tampa, which, I mean, okay, they're an Eastern Conference team. They're a good defensive team, so you might want to... But why not just go all out in the first period? You can f- get a feel for them while you're doing that, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, when Tampa scores uh, their first goal, it's off of another turnover. It's off of another dumb pass that just has been going throughout the Stars in the later half of this season. It's it's another pass that, you know, shouldn't be made. It's a pass that there, there were a million different options, but they, they chose to do the worst one possible. And then they scramble back and... Ultimately, it kind of just pinballs everywhere and then gets past Kari. Uh, when you saw that goal, I mean, it's a bad goal to give up. But did you like the response that Dallas gave? Yeah, I will. Um, I think there for a little bit, they seemed a little down. I don't know if Spetz's line came out right after that, but it seemed as soon as his line stepped on the ice, Spetz had an agenda. And that was to to get the puck and score. I mean, ultimately, it's not off this his stick that it goes in off. It goes off the goalie stick. But at the same time, they'll take it, fluke for a fluke. I mean, Spezza can Spezza can score any any way he wants. It right now, Spezza is feeling it. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's just that thing an athlete gets that anything he does can just go his way. Now, in uh, Ruff, after the game, kind of, they were talking about Spezza, and Ruff was saying, like, his offensive game is off the charts right now, but he's still, Ruff is still kind of nudging Spezza to clean up a lot of his defensive uh, areas. Not to say that he was terrible in the game, but Ruff says that, you know, he still has some work to do on his defense side. I mean, it's, it's pretty noticeable, too. Whenever you, if you actually go back and like take a look at Spets in the defensive zone, he coasts a lot of the time. He he and he he goes to his one position, and he'll either stay there and not do anything else, or he'll just try to coast to the blue lines and try and get the breakout. And as a center, you can't be doing that. You got to be playing defensive hockey, helping your defenseman out. Yeah. And the the split up of Jamie Benn and Tyler Sagan, it's now what on its third game that they're split up now, I think, or their their second game after the St. Louis game. Uh, Sagan with Spezza and Nachushkin, how do you like that line as a whole? I mean, you get Spezza the playmaker, you get Sagan a playmaker and a scorer. You have Nachushkin, who's a scorer, but I feel that there's too much playmaker attitude on that on that line. 
I mean, Spets has shown that he can score, but I don't. I don't think that it's helping Sagan out that much. Well, uh, as we see, I mean, it, it's it's working out in a sense. Is that you know they're they're the line that's not really getting scored on. They're creating a lot of the chances. So I do I do see what you're saying. Is that you know you would like some grit on each line. You don't want to overload a line to where it your all your offense is coming from one way. But you know they're. Once Sagan got moved away from Jamie, it seems as if, you know, his mind is going a little bit more on the defensive side because Spezza does have the puck a lot. Uh, Nachushkin, he'll have the puck a lot too much, I think. Um, but it does seem like that line is creating a lot more than it's giving up. Um, Jamie's line, you know, was still out, or Jamie was out there for a goal, but... He has a three-point night and make, kind of makes up for that. So does Cody Eakin. But, you know, I think a lot of the luck is falling on Spezza's line because of how good Spezza has been playing lately. Um, you know, Sagan finishes with a plus two. Uh, Spezza finishes with a, with a zero. I mean, so... it just It just seems like... You know the the Spezza and Sagan is working really well, but then we hear today that uh, Sagan is going to be out for three to four weeks. So, with that, you know Spezza has already shown that he is stepping up to try to get this team to where it needs to be. You would assume that uh, Richie now makes this lineup every night. Do you? Would you? Would you? like seeing Richie in this lineup every night? I would like to, but it all depends on if Yanmark's coming back or not. Because if Yanmark's coming back, then I still feel Richie gets Rich, Richie gets the boot. Just because, you know, yeah, it, it, you have to admit it, you love watching Richie play. You love his talent, you love his grit, you love his physicality, you love everything about the kid. But the stars right now are going to rely more on on Yanmark over Richie just because he's been with the team for the entire season. But yeah, you, he does have that little like seniority uh, thing going for him. But I, I just think that you know with you know Klingberg's coming back in, I have a feeling uh, Jordy will be back in the lineup. So you're gonna see uh, Alexiak and Nimeth fighting to get back into the lineup and Johns is I think with the signing that Johns has just did he remains in the lineup because he's a right handed shot and so is Jason Demers well I mean you, you're you not going to be able to do that with waivers you, you're only allowed to have a certain amount of scratched players up on the lineup Right. you're only allowed 21 players so inevitably Johns is going to be, need to be sent down well uh, Unless you want to risk sending Alexiak or Nemeth down on waivers, because they both have one-way contracts, so it's it's going to come down to if they want that right-handed shot of Johns to stay up, they're going to have to take a risk. Or, in my opinion, I would send Moen down. I would send Moen down to the AHL if he gets picked up off waivers. I mean, is it really that big of a loss for Dallas? Because you have Richie, you got Foxa, Sevier, Yamark, all these players that can rotate throughout the lineup. Yeah, I mean, I I, I see what you're saying, um, but I honestly think the way Johns has played and that contract, I think he stays in the lineup. Um, but with that puck luck that's going on with the Stars and Spezza. Because you know the stars aren't getting a lot of the the puck luck per se, except for Spezza. But on the Stamkos goal, the power play goal, you know it, that kills the streak. I think at like 21, and I think Tampa was like 0 for like 20 before they score. Uh, was there anything that stuck out to you on the first Stamkos goal? Yeah, uh, I pointed it out. That uh, Sevier, you know, he's in he's in the position, you know, they got the diamond going on. But then for some reason, 
when the puck goes to the point, Sevier decides to edge away from the side that Stamkos is on and goes to the middle of the ice. I guess to try and protect the shot from getting in, maybe do a shot block. But now he's left Stamkos all alone in the OB spot. You know, and Stamkos has proven that that's not just Ovechkin's spot, that it's his spot, it's Sagan's spot, it's these elite sniper spots. Yeah. I, I also noticed, like, if you go back and you watch that uh, um, that that video, the replay, you know, Sevier does, you know, move over. And like you said, Stamkos is going to be in that OB spot, just like Sagan goes. But, you know, you got to... It's Steven Stamkos. Someone has to be on him at all times. Like, let the other players, you know, do what they need to do, but leave Sevier, like, on or leave a defenseman on Stamkos. Like, don't let that... Let everybody else try to beat you, you know? It just doesn't seem that he's able to just stand all alone right there. And then... The way Kari gets over, he does it kind of awkwardly. You can't really fault Kari. You know, he's doing his job. And the way the rebound comes out, you would think, you know, if someone was on him, someone should have been there to kind of swipe at the puck to get it out. So, I mean, Kari's rebound control, I didn't have a problem with on that goal. You know, he I think him sliding over, he kind of like second-guessed himself and leaves like that huge hole under his arm. But ultimately, I think you you have to question what Sevier was doing by sliding over more to the middle instead of staying on his side where Stamkos is. Um, but then, you know, we see Jamie answer back. But it was a very Jamie Benn-like goal. You know, we haven't seen a goal like that from Jamie Benn in a long time. You know, he, he pounces on a turnover right there, and he's able to pick a pick the top corner over Ben Bishop. You know, he just has not had that scorer score goal in a long time. And it was just nice to see, you know, having, you know, one goal like that, can bring all sorts of confidence to you. And when I'm, we'll talk about that on his second goal as well because you know, a goal like that reassures you that you are one of the best in the league. Especially going top shelf on Bishop. He's yeah. like 6'7 or some, some mm-hmm. ridiculous height. Yeah, and then but, you know, it was the captain show in the second period. We see Steven Stamkos score again off of another defensive breakdown to where he gets all alone. He has... Steven Stamkos has that Brett Hull-like... He can disappear into the shadows and then just reappear whenever he needs to. It's like he's Nightcrawler out there. He can get just zip-zap wherever he needs to be. Uh, you know, the stars get pinned into their own zone. They can't get it out. And... Goligoski just kind of loses him. I don't like that that pass gets over through because it goes through Russell's skates and then goes right past Goligoski. And, you know, as soon as Goligoski turns his head to look where the puck is going, the puck's already in the back of the net because it's Steven Stamkos and he's all alone. Nine times out of ten, he scores that. Because he had a chance like that in the game again, he could have had a hat trick. That's why you say nine times out of ten that he scores that because he missed on a similar chance in the game as well uh it's those defensive breakdowns that and it was a it was late in the period it's another bad goal that you see the uh stars take did you think with that goal you know this is probably not going dallas's way oh yeah especially at the end you know like you said that that's a demoralizer right there like you're you're playing hard, you tie it up, and you're 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 fighting to stay in the game. You're fighting to get that next goal. And Dallas had plenty of chances, but then that one goal goes in off a defensive breakdown. And then, like, I mean, you gotta recover from it. But then you start asking, like, well, what are we doing? Like, what's not going our way right now? 
Yeah, it's it's those late period goals that Dallas has been victims of to where they can't get the motivation back into their squad to start fighting back. But in this game, I think with the presence of Brendan Morrow there and, you know, it's a, it's a retirement party, it's Brendan Morrow night, it's captain night, Jamie Benn, and you see him step away from the face-off in the second period because, you know, everyone's giving him, you know, the applause. You know, it just seemed Jamie Benn had one of those nights where he took over. It wasn't the best Jamie Benn game, but it was good enough to where Jamie said, no, we're not going to lose this one. Going into the third period, you see a little bit more momentum out of the Dallas Stars. You know, someone must have, during the intermission, said, hey, we need to pick this up because, you know, if we lose this, it's going to be pretty embarrassing for, you know, Brendan Morrill's retirement and everything like that. We want to we want to pay respect to him. And we get a, an NHL first for Steven Johns. He gets his first career goal. He's played four games. He has one goal, zero assist. He's a minus three, but he has 19 hits in four games. That's, you know, and there was a stat out that if he had been playing the whole season, he would be leading the club by like 150 hits. With the, with the average of what it would come out to. Neil signs him for that, that contract extension. This kid, if he continues to play the way he does, he's now a 50% shooter. And those other three games, he didn't have a shot on goal. He had two shots in this game and scored on one of them. He's a 50% uh he has a 50% shot percentage. I think you brought that up in the contract negotiations. Like, yeah. Well, I score 50% of the time. Exactly. And so, like, the upside is so huge. I think Steven Johns is going to be the future of this defense. I honestly think, no offense to Klingberg, I think he's a great defenseman and he will get better. But I don't like building around Klingberg. I like building around Johns better. I like a big bad defense more than I like an agile defense. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's it's, it's kind of like it would be really good if like maybe Klingberg or Johns could learn to shoot left-handed or something. Put those two up as a top pair. It'd be like kind of like having like a Darian Hatcher and a Zergei Zuboff out there. I mean, you got your big bruiser and you got your your point producer, so. It would be nice to have that, but you know, they'll probably be on different pairings because they're both right-handed shots. Yeah, uh, Klingberg is a great, uh, great defenseman, but I just fear him coming back in the lineup that it goes more skill-based than it does physicality, because the skill base is is there with uh, Johns. He moves the puck well. He skates well. I just I just don't like the thought of building around Klingberg. I don't think he's the future. I think he's a piece in the future. I just don't think the defense needs to be a small, agile defenseman like a Carlson. I like, no offense to Carlson, but big defensemen win championships. You know, it's the big-time Charas, uh, Dowdies. It's those type of defensemen that establish, you know, physicality and a presence. Nobody wants to play against type deal. Instead of, like, the Klingbergs, like, okay, we can play against him. We just have to contain him. Wow. You can't contain, you know, strength. You can try, but that, that brings more focus onto that to let your other players do it. And I think that's what we need. I, I definitely agree. Um, that's, a, that's another fear that I have. With all these players coming back, is it goes back you know, to we're playing, we're we're getting better defensively, and we're still finding ways to win games. But when we get all of these players back, and we start sending our youth back out of the lineup. Is it going to revert back to no defense? Like the beginning offense? of the year type yeah. stuff, yeah. So that's one thing I worry about. That's one thing I worry about as well. 
after John's first NHL goal, we have a sweet, sweet feed from Eakin behind the back, behind the red line, back out to Jamie. He throws a backhander on net, beats Ben Bishop. Going back to his first goal, that has that first goal had to be, have built the confidence to just throw that backhand on net. It was one of Jamie's best goals of the season because he just looked confident enough to do it. You know, Jamie would throw shots like that, you know, kind of on net, but it just never felt like there was a purpose behind it. The confidence that he got from the first goal had to have led to his second. And with the stars up, I think like it was like seven minutes left, you know, this you could see the stars, you know, start to tighten up and buckle down and really start playing defensive minded. What I liked about this game, who led the stars in hits this game? I seem to be wrong every time you well, ask. Yeah, it, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, John's. It wasn't Sagan. It was. It was Sagan. Sagan had five hits. Uh, Patrick Eves had five hits. Roussel had one. The the players that we're not counting on to give us the physical aspect are giving us that aspect. And then some that we count on aren't bringing it as much as we thought they were going to down the stretch. I should expect Roussel to be finishing with like three to six hits every night. I think from now on, if he doesn't take, you know, a page out of Brendan Morrow's book, he needs to be benched. He needs to get pulled aside and say, hey, you need to get out there and you need to start bringing something. I know he had a fight. He fought Callahan. I think Callahan is above Roussel's weight class. I think Roussel bit off more than he could chew on that one. I liked them fighting, but that it's a little too far between fights that I like. You know, it's you know, they were down in this game and so I liked Roussel fighting, but we need to see that on a more consistent basis. I don't want to see him finishing with uh, a couple of turnovers and one hit in a game. Not in a big game against like Tampa, who's a really good team. I don't want to see him finishing with one hit in like an LA game or a St. Louis game. Yes, we're about to play the Blackhawks again, but I don't want those to just be his highlight games. I want every game him go out, put his body on the line for this team. That's his role. I don't want to see Sagan and Patrick Eves having to bring the physicality for this team. Anything else uh, you wanted to touch on? Uh, I was actually going to say that it's, it's good to see Sagan throwing the body out there. And hopefully he heals quick because... He's definitely going to be needed for the playoffs. Yeah, because I think I think he him playing more defensive hockey is kind of him getting ready for playoff mode. So I, I I absolutely agree. Him stepping up the way he is was putting him in playoff mode. It sucks seeing him go down. It really does because um, this happened to him last year. You know there was a playoff push and he got hurt. Well, now we can just hope that Ben goes on a tear again. Exactly. Uh, and then, and you know, game. Richie being in the lineup, I, I want to see more out of him. Uh, Yanmark, we need big games out of him. And Sevier, all these players, all these young players that 30 goals, 30 plus goals just went out the door. Who's going to step up to fill that gap in? That's, uh, what, that's what I want. My money's on Yanmark. Hmm. Uh, Kari, how'd you think he played? Decent. He played well enough to get the win. Yeah, that's there's that's. Not, there's not much else to say about it. You know, he he got the win, and that's all I care about. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how I felt about uh, the game as well. Let's go into the ratings of this one. What did you rate this one? I gave it a, a B. You know, it's a good game. B for Brendan. They they won. Uh, Jamie had an amazing game. You know, John's got his first goal, but they're still defensive breakdowns you know these are things that just need to be addressed and try to fix before the playoffs you know you got 10 more games left to get yourselves prepared to play playoff hockey 
and I, I think that they're starting to do it now. So hopefully they come out and bring it to the to the Blackhawks again, keep them down in the standings. I I gave an A because the determination, the the will to win from Jamie, it just seemed like it was there. Uh, yeah, Brendan Morrow in for his retirement. I mean, you got to give some extra credit for for that. I I think it deserved it. Let's go into the predictions for the next game. We have the Islanders in for the next one. These are always uh, bring your pistols because it's going to be a shootout type games. Oh, I mean, what was the score of the last one? Like six to five. Six to five. So I feel who, whoever's going to win this game, it's going to be offensive again like, like the Tampa Bay game. First one to score four or five goals is going to win. So I'll say Dallas wins five to three. And then if the Islanders come out, you know, I feel it'll be because defensive breakdowns team may think that they're better than the Islanders, even though they got beat by them. So they may not play to their full extent. So we'll say the Islanders win six to three. Uh, New York teams tend to have the Dallas Stars uh, number. It's not a very good record over the past couple of seasons. I like a score of four to two for Dallas. And I like a score of five to two for the Islanders. That's the show. Be sure to subscribe, like the video, leave any kind of feedback down below. Remember, this is a show for fans, by fans. Without that... We don't grow, and as always, tune in next time.